stanza 16, verses 121 to 128. I have done justice and righteousness. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Be surety for your servant for good. Do not let the arrogant oppress me. My eyes fail with longing for your salvation and for your righteous word. Deal with your servant according to your loving kindness and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. It is time for the Lord to act, for they have broken the law, your law. Therefore, I love your commandments above gold, yes, above fine gold. Therefore, I esteem right all your precepts concerning everything. I hate every false way. Thus far, God's holy word. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, two weeks ago, when the attacks took place in Paris, Every one of us had a sense of indignation, of zeal, of a certain fury that uh, innocent people uh, would be attacked and murdered in that way. But what we felt two weeks ago probably in no way measures to what we felt when our own country was attacked on 9-11, at least those of us that are citizens of this country, because it's our country and we have a uh, a covenant relationship. We have a citizenship. We have an ownership. And thus the zeal was even greater. Now the same is true personally. We have a responsibility when a friend is slandered or attacked to uh, defend his name as we learned from the uh, Ninth Commandment. But if it's your wife or your husband, one to whom you are attached with love and covenant, there's a much greater zeal uh, if someone spoke in front of your wife uh, with coarse uh, and gross language, you would uh, vindicate her. If someone insulted her or slandered her, you would defend her honor. You love her, but you're also committed to defend her. Now what the psalmist is showing us in this stanza before us uh, this morning is that because of this covenant commitment that he's described that we have to the Lord God we are pilgrims but as pilgrims we are servants of Jehovah that we have an obligation to be zealous for the honor of God and for his word he shows us from his own experience uh, how that zeal operates but he also shows us in this stanza uh, the need that we have for God's protection, but God's wisdom uh, in times when we need to express zeal or act in order to defend uh, God's honor. And we think about the days in which we live. I trust you can see the timeliness of this stanza. I know in my own lifetime, and probably, which is pretty long now, and probably for maybe even a couple hundred years, perhaps even as long as our country has been in existence, we have never seen the rise of evil in America that we see in these days. As we see the secularism of the culture around us and the declension of the church. Well, what's your response to this? We are in the Bible Belt. We are, to some degree, um, protected from much of what is going on around us. And yet, we see it, we read about it. What's your response? What's your response to the condition of the church? Yes, here and every place in our country, and even worse, uh, in uh, Europe and the West and those who are the heirs of the Reformation. Well, the psalmist shows us that we should be longing for the vindication of God and His Word. And pray then as servants, both for protection and wisdom, that as we long for the vindication of God and His Word, as servants of Jehovah, we are praying for protection and for wisdom. So I'm going to open the psalm up under three headings. Uh, the, the servant of Jehovah expresses zeal for Jehovah and his word. The servant of Jehovah seeks uh, the protection of the Lord and the servant of Jehovah prays for 
the wisdom of the Lord. First, the psalmist uh, shows us how to express zeal as he, as the servant of the Lord, expresses his zeal in the last three verses of the stanza. It is time for the Lord to act, for they've broken your law. Therefore, I love your commandments above gold, yes, above fine gold. Therefore, I esteem right all your precepts concerning everything. I hate every false way. Now, he expresses the zeal in two ways. He expresses uh, zeal for God's honor and expresses zeal for God's word. Verse 126, he expresses zeal for God's honor. He says it's time uh, for Jehovah to act because they've broken your law. Now, both the ESV and New American Standard translate this term broken. And here's the place where the King James, New King James, is much more on target. It means to make void, to invalidate, to make null. It's not simply that people are sinning and violating God's law. No, they act with an enmity and hatred toward God's law. It's the difference between uh, breaking the law by getting a traffic ticket and acting in anarchy and seeking to overthrow uh, the government of our country. As God's children, we are going to break God's law every day, as you well know, in thought, word, and deed. But it's the haters of God that are seeking to invalidate, make null, and void the word of God. And that's what the psalmist is reacting to here. This is what we must react to as we see around us this rise of wickedness and unrighteousness. As we see the agenda of, uh, uh, of the homosexual community, not content uh, merely to have their own way. No, the agenda is to silence Christians and to uh, mock and make fun of the Word of God. And of course, uh, the Muslims, well, they hate the Word of God as well. And they consider us infidels and will do everything they can. But there's an interesting um, coalescence that is happening here between the multiculturalism, the secularism of our day and what's happening in Islam. And it is illustrated in what occurred in um, Paris two weeks ago. The band that was doing the concert where some 88 young people were murdered was called the Eagles of Death Metal Band. When the Muslims, who think that we are the great Satan, attacked the um, concert, they were doing the salute to the devil, singing, I love Satan. You see the irony of this? You see the justice of God in this? You see what we have here is the, is the collision of the multiculturalism, the godlessness of the West, the scourge, and think of Habakkuk, Lord, they're more wicked than we are, the scourge of Islam now, clashing here in Paris. Now, nobody's heard about the clash that takes place culturally there. And the judgment of God that is occurring in all such acts like this. But these are the kind of things that we are up against. And it's God's honor, though, that's at stake. It's not our honor. It's not our reputation. And so the psalmist teaches us here to plead. It's time for the Lord to act. What bold language. It's a language that expresses urgency. It's not dissimilar when that psalmist prays, How long, O Lord? It's time, O Lord. Uh, your name is being dishonored. Your church is being persecuted, and men are seeking to destroy her and to drag Christ through the mud. It's time to act. And this is the type of, of fervency that needs to grip our hearts in days like this. And you look at your heart. Do you have that zeal? Are you calling out to God? It's time to act, not dictating to Him but expressing the urgency and the longing of your own heart 
for the glory of God. But the zeal for God's honor as God's name is being maligned and his word nullified, as men can try to do it, leads to a personal zeal for his word. Now notice the connection. And it's a bit strange, isn't it? He says, it's time to act. They've nullified your law. Therefore, I love your testimonies. Now, as we sing it, it says because, but it, it, it's a therefore. And I think we see this in our own experience. If some, someone, something you love is maligned or ridiculed or whatever, your appreciation grows for that person or that thing. And as the psalmist is seeing God's uh, uh, word and God's honor nullified, it intensifies his own zeal for the Word of God. And he expresses the zeal in three ways. In intensity, in comprehensiveness, and in exclusiveness. In intensity, he says, Therefore, I love your commandments, the moral precepts of God's Word, above gold, yes, above fine gold. Take the finest of gold the most refined gold, the most expensive gold. He says, I love your word, your moral law, more than all of the riches of men. Do you love God's word that way? If it was right now, lose all your possessions or lose your Bible, would you rationalize? Well, I, I know a lot of the Bible and uh, you know I'll be able to I'll, I'll recover from this. Are you willing to walk away from everything for the sake of the Word of God? All treasures, all human delights. You know, we have brothers and sisters that are doing that. We have brothers and sisters whose children cannot get a college education because they love God's Word more than all treasure. They're forced to go work at contemptible labor and waste what we would say waste good minds because they love God's Word. Now you could rationalize, well I need the education and then I can promote God's Word. But you would have to deny it to do that. Do you love God's Word above all treasure? With that intensity, think honestly about it. Think honestly of the things that you cherish most and ask God to give you the ability to say, I love your word above that treasure, above that thing. Now, the comprehensive nature of the zeal is expressed in verse 128. And it's a difficult verse to translate. I esteem right all your precepts concerning everything. There's two coals here. And it's very difficult to put together, but this is a good approximation. What he's saying is, I love everything about your word, everything your word teaches, everything your word commands. There wasn't a commandment that the psalmist did not love. There wasn't a doctrine in which he did not delight. And so must our zeal for God's word be. All that he commands, when it rubs against our wills, and against our personal predilections and pleasures, we must be able to say, I love your word in all that it commands, in everything that it teaches. And then, it's an exclusive zeal for the word of God. I hate every false way. He's already said this earlier in verse 104. He doesn't hate the people. And we're not to hate the people. We're to love our enemies and to pray for them. Think the analogy of a mother whose child is killed by a drunk driver. Now, if she's a Christian, she will pray for the drunk driver. Uh, she will seek not to have any bitterness toward him. Now, I'm not one that says she should forgive him because if he's not asked for forgiveness in a proper manner, but she should have no grudges or bitterness against him. But she hates drunk driving. She will become a member of Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And she will labor against the act of drunk driving because she hates it. 
That's the, the attitude that we're to have. So we must not hate Muslims, even the most radical Muslims. We, we must pray for them and, and that God, if he would, show them mercy. And if not, we don't hate them if we pray for their destruction. We just love God more and his honor. But we pray that God would convert them. If not, that he would remove them. But we hate their religion. And we hate their acts. And we hate all that they do against God and his word and his church. We don't hate, we must not hate homosexuals. We must not be guilty of some homophobia. We must love all men and women uh, with a gospel compassion. But we hate what they do. We hate their agenda. We hate what they're trying to do to our country and to our culture. And so we hate every false way. But I have found this to be a great deterrent in my own heart. Because we are to hate every false way inside of us. Again, we don't hate ourselves. But if we really love ourselves as we ought to, we hate every false way. You hate every false way. I found it a great deterrent against temptation. When my mind begins to go a direction it should not go, I say this first, I hate every false way. And God blesses that verse to me as a fortification against sin. And we must cultivate this hatred for all sin in our own lives and not tolerate it for one moment. And so the psalmist expresses his zeal for God, for God's honor, for God's word. And we must be gripped with such a zeal in the time in which we live. But such a zeal exposes us even to greater difficulties than if we did not have or express that zeal. And so the psalmist uh, teaches us in verses 121 and 120 uh, through 123 to... Um, Seek God's protection. I've done justice and righteousness. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Be surety for your servant for good. Do not let the arrogant oppress me. My eyes fail with longing for your salvation and for your righteous word. He returns now to a theme that he's often addressed in this psalm, and that is the arrogant oppressors of himself and of the church of the Lord God. They are full of hubris. They are proud and erring and despisers of God and of God's people and treat God's people and the ways of God's people with contempt, particularly when there is a zeal for God's law. Perhaps you heard what happened to Tim Tebow this week. His girlfriend broke up with him because he loved her enough to be chaste and not to be promiscuous. Now, obviously, she has no shame. She tells the world, I break up with this man because he won't be promiscuous. And he's mocked then because he lets a beautiful woman go away because he has biblical standards. He's often been mocked. And we should pray for him because he has been very consistent, except on the Lord's Day, he's been very consistent on God's law. And you know he's going to be attacked and attacked and attacked by Satan as well as men to compromise but this is the kind of thing that happens. He takes a stand and he's ridiculed. He was ridiculed for giving praise to God. And so it's going to be with all of us in the situations where we find ourselves able to express gospel commitment, a love for God's law, the arrogant oppressors will slander us and mock us. That's the least that they will do. And you understand that if they had opportunity, they would do much more. It's but the fact that they are curtailed by the sovereign power and grace of God. And that's what the psalmist is teaching us how to pray. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Be surety for your servant for good. Don't leave me to my oppressors. Don't desert me. Don't turn me over to them. And particularly, don't let me give in. Uh, give me grace to endure, not to capitulate. Protect me, protect my testimony. And he asked God to do so by being the surety for your servant 
Here's this covenant language now. He is the servant of Jehovah, in covenant with Jehovah, be surety for good. Now, good has to do with deliverance, with salvation. And the surety is the one who stands in the place and guarantees the good outcome. Job pled with God that God would provide a surety for him. There's a wonderful expression of this by uh, King Hezekiah in <coughs> Isaiah 38. I believe he had this passage of Scripture in mind. This is, he gives us, after God says he will heal him, he gives us his prayer both of petition as well as thanksgiving. But he says in verse 14, Like a swallow, like a crane, so I twitter, I moan, like a dove, this is with the news that he's dying. And you know, Perkins points out here, I never had thought about it, is that um, you realize he didn't have a, a male heir. It wasn't just a personal, uh, I don't want to die. No, this, the whole Davidic covenant was on the line as he is pleading with God to spare his life. And so uh, he is moaning. My eyes look wistfully to the height, that's my eyes fail. O oh Lord, I am oppressed, be my security. Same word, be my security. The psalmist is teaching us to ask God to be the guarantor of our safety. Not physical safety, if, if he's willing to do so, that's fine. But of our spiritual safety, to keep our souls, to give us grace to endure. And of course, this prayer itself is fulfilled predictive and fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. As the writer of the Hebrews reminds us that he is the perfect surety in chapter 7 verse 22. So much more also Jesus has become the guarantee, that's a surety, of a better covenant. Chapter 8 verse 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he also is the mediator of a better covenant enacted on better promises. The mediator of the covenant is the surety. Our Savior, by his incarnation, his perfect obedience, his sacrificial death on the cross, his burial in our place, his resurrection, his ascension, his exercising office of prophet, priest, and king, both in the state of humiliation and exaltation. He's the surety. He stands between us and the wrath of God as the guarantor that we are delivered. He stands with us against all of the malice of Satan and the curse, condemnation of the law. He stands between us and death and has removed the stinger from death. But because he is our surety in those ways. You understand He is your surety every day for everything. He is the guarantor that God will not leave you in the hands of oppressors. And that God will keep you from denying Him. Now only by God's grace can you be kept, but God pledges Himself to give us grace as we rest in Him. Not to give us over to the wiles of our oppressors. And so He, he, uh, he teaches us here to plead with God that God will be our surety. And notice the intensity with which we are to pray in verse 123. My eyes fail for your salvation. Again, he's used this expression in verse 82. It's the idea of looking with intense expectation to God and waiting on Him. It's an expression that it expresses both the earnestness of prayer and the perseverance of prayer. It's used uh, by Jeremiah in Lamentation as uh, he is pleading with God and, and praying for uh, the church in her own uh, suffering. And he says in, in verse uh, 2 or um, 11, My eyes fail because of tears. My spirit's greatly troubled. My heart is poured out on the earth because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. When little ones and infants faint in the streets of the city. Verse 18, their heart cried out to the Lord. O wall of the daughter of Zion, let your tears run down like a river day and night. And give yourself no relief. Let your eyes have no rest. Looking in intense prayer 
to God with fervency and earnestness. Is this how we pray? I'm so indicted by the larger catechism, 185. How are we to pray? We are to pray with an awful apprehension of the majesty of God, a deep sense of our own unworthiness, necessities, and sins, with penitent, thankful, and enlarged hearts, with understanding, faith, sincerity, fervency, love, and perseverance, waiting upon Him, with humble submission to His will. My prayers are often dry and cold, and not from an enlarged heart. But the psalmist's prayers were from an enlarged heart. His eyes failed with longing and with weeping. And it's a persevering prayer then, as the Catechism says, to pray with perseverance. As our Savior gives the parable in Luke 18 and says uh, that you will pray and faint not. Or as he gives the parable in Luke chapter 11 of the friend who comes to his neighbor's house and he needs bread because he's got unexpected company. And the man who's his friend doesn't want to get up and give him the bread. And he says because of his persistence, and the word is shamelessness, because of his shamelessness, he gets up and gives him bread. And then he gives that great promise, all in present tense. Seek and ye shall find. Asking you shall receive, seeking you shall find, knock, it shall be opened unto you. Present tense commandments and promises, persevering. God most often does not answer our prayers the first time we ask them. Now, if we're in immediate danger and we need immediate grace or protection, yes. But He's training us. He wants our eyes to fail with that longing of looking to Him as servants to the Master and pleading and arguing that he would have mercy on his church. When I read the way Jeremiah prayed it in Lamentation, I think he must have had in mind the instruction that has been given to us in Isaiah uh, chapter uh, 60. Uh, Two, verse 6, On your walls, O Jerusalem, I've appointed watchmen all day and all night. They'll never keep silent. You who remind the Lord, remember Isaiah says, take no rest. You remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves and give Him no rest until He establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by His right hand and by His strong arm. And He goes on. We are to plead with this intensity. The psalmist enforces his prayer with two grounds or arguments. One of the things we learn from Psalm 119 is how to plead with God, how to um, ground our petitions in biblical uh, arguments. And he gives us two here. The first is a good conscience. I have done justice and righteousness. This very expression leads me uh, with this evidence to think that David is the author of Psalm 119. It's the very language described his rule in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 8. It summarizes he ruled, he acted, exactly the same Hebrew, with justice and righteousness. He publicly had a good conscience, but he also privately had a good conscience. He could say earlier in his life, in 1 Samuel 24, with respect to Saul, that he acted with integrity of conscience the way he treated Saul. And so, good conscience is the ground of bold praying. Nehemiah understood that. We won't look at it, but Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 14, 22, and 31, where he uh, pleads with God to further the Reformation and revival that took place because of his faithfulness. He wasn't pleading merit, because in there he asked for compassion. But he's praying boldly. And so, if you're following McShane, you'll be reading in 1 John uh, this very relationship of bold praying to clear conscience. Chapter 3, verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, that's a clear conscience. We have confidence before God. And whatever we ask from Him, because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. Whatever we ask, we receive from Him. And so, we keep a conscience that's clear for a number of reasons, but here's one of them. It gives us boldness in prayer as it does the psalmist here. We are the servants of the Lord. 
And thus, we keep a clear conscience so we can say, Lord, it's not by my merit, but it's by my heart desire to please you and to honor you. And so, he teaches us to, to pray for vindication uh, or for protection on the basis of a conscience, but also on the basis of God's promises. My eyes fail for your salvation and for your righteous word. The righteous God has given us a word in this Hebrew for promises. That His righteousness stands behind all the promises. They're all yea and amen in Christ Jesus, aren't they? And we're to plead those promises. And when you read in 1 John that you pray according to His will, that He grants you those things, then you search the Scriptures for God's will. Um, is it God's will that you'll be sanctified? Yes. Is it God's will the church will be glorified? Yes. And so you pray and you give Him no rest and plead those promises with so many others that we have in Scripture. And then, just very quickly, we must have wisdom as we interact with the oppressors with zeal that we do so with biblical balance. And so the, the servant of Jehovah not only expresses his zeal and seeks vindication, but he prays for wisdom. He says in verses 124 and 125, Deal with your servant according to your loving kindness and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. You know, some 16 times in this psalm, the psalmist asked God to teach him from the Word. This is an inspired writer of Scripture. I've said it before. If he needs the illumination of the Holy Spirit to understand Scripture, how much more do you and I need it? But you see here, he didn't simply want to know the facts of Scripture. That's the relationship of, of um, teach me your statutes, but give me understanding. The statutes of God, uh, the moral uh, uh, revelation of God that makes us wise, and we want to understand them, not just facts, but the wisdom. That's what we're taught to pray for, the wisdom to know how we are to act in all of the situations of our lives. And again, grounded upon two things, God's loving kindness. It's His covenant love. Psalmist is coming as the covenant servant. The basis of God's loving kindness, He will hear your prayer. You open the scriptures every morning, you sit under preaching, you preach the Word of God, and you begin here. Teach me your statutes according to your loving kindness. That prayer never goes unanswered. Never. But give, you, give me understanding. And notice the second ground is this covenant relationship. Again, he uses twice here the word servant, both verses. Give me understanding, give your servant, that I may know your testimonies. That's the covenant word. Psalm, Psalm 25 says he makes known his covenant to those who are his friends. The secret of his covenant. He gives us the wisdom, the covenant wisdom of His Word because we are His servants and we are in this relationship with Him and thus we know that He is going to be our instructor and the one who will make us wise. It's a longing for God's, the vindication of God's honor. And we're taught as God's servants to pray both for protection and for wisdom. It is so necessary today that we have backbone that our hearts burn with zeal as the heart of the Savior did, who was consumed with jealousy for the house and honor of his Father. Can that be said of you today? Or is your response nonchalant? Oh, maybe anger over this thing or that thing, but is there a certain burning in your belly because of the dishonor of God, because of the decline of our culture, because of the weakness of the bride of Christ, the church? Well, it's a very good indication of your love for God's Word. You see, if you love the Word the way the psalmist does, with intensity and comprehensiveness and exclusiveness, that fire is going to burn. You're going to have this zeal and passion for the glory of God and the glory of His Word. And we want to live with this. I want you to go out of here as those men who are burning with passion for the glory of God and the glory of His Word. But then there's two things that we must be careful. 
We must not go in our own strength. We're not out ranting and raving. We're not resorting to the sword. He who lives by the sword dies by the sword. Privately, I can boycott certain things, but it's not the church's responsibility to take up the sort of boycotting this industry or that thing because they sell to these people or promote that kind. No, that's not how we express our zeal. Privately do so if you wish. But we don't rant and rave, we don't manipulate, we don't seek the means of the world, we seek the ways of God on our knees, praying with God, and then speaking as we have opportunity with wisdom and love, not with contempt and arrogance, not responding to arrogance with arrogance. And that leads to the second thing, we need the wisdom of God's Word. We need to know how to speak, how to think, how to speak, how to teach, how to conduct ourselves. And what we have here is the guarantee that God will enable us to respond with zeal in the days in which we live. Father, thank you for a word. Again, we revel in the practicality of your word and the wisdom of your spirit and the timeliness of this passage. Oh, Lord, awaken our cold hearts. Let there be a burning in our bellies. Let us become fervent in our praying and give us the wisdom that we need, Lord, to know how to speak to this culture in these days. And above all, Lord, revive your church. Vindicate her. Overthrow her enemies. But, Lord, revive her. Quicken and awaken her in these days for Christ's sake. Amen.